This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 148 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have a whole passel of people on our show, and everything from a movie star to um, somebody who I think is a horse star in my eyes. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me today. How are you, Jen? Greetings. Happy almost holiday season. I know. I'm getting excited. This actually comes out December 1, so when people are listening to this through the holidays, I guess we better sing something. No, no. No, that we wouldn't do that to you. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, but we actually, you know, the movie theme here, I'm so excited to have a, a movie star on our show today, and better yet, he's a horse lover, and he has rescued a horse. I mean, is that like a hero in your eyes, or what? You know, that is so relatable, because... Probably just just about anybody listening to this show has at some point in their life rescued a horse in some way. Sometimes that's taking one from a rescue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's one that was just not having a good time of things and they helped the human work through it so that that human could give them the life that they deserved, both human and horse. So there's so many different ways to rescue horses. It's not just gathering them in. And I think that's a really neat story that Cameron brings to the fore about it's a two-way street, the rescue thing. Absolutely. And sometimes parallels, parallel stories going and they come together, which is a pretty cool way too. And I think that's kind of what he's going to talk a little bit about today. So I'm excited to hear that. And then two great gals from our local area, from the San Inez Valley, who are um, doing great work partnering to have equine equine assisted learning. And that encompasses a lot these days. And they're smart girls, really interesting. Yeah, they're, They're very bright, very sharp. Yeah, the kind mm-hmm. of people that we really need to cherish and encourage more of yeah, very when it good. comes to being around horses. Because I don't know that traditionally what we would think of as in the horse business, they're mm-hmm. not showing in any classes and things like that. They're, it's a much deeper relationship that they're working with to help people who they're not going to go to the Olympics on a horse and they're probably not going to buy a horse and train it for their own. But the value of that horse-human relationship is so obvious and so important. And and I think they, they bring us something really unique to the table there. And we're going to get right to both of our guests after we hear from our title sponsor, Omega Fields. Well, we've been using Horse Shine for years now, and I'm with Rafael Valle. And why don't you just tell us about your experience with Omega Fields Horse Shine? Oh, I'll be glad to. It is absolutely an amazing product, and I've been using Omega Horse Shine on Ivory Pal since 2004. As you can see from his pictures and videos on his Facebook page, Ivory Pal remains as healthy as ever with a golden shiny coat and strong bear hooves, muscle tone, and a great immune system attributed to him being on Omega Horse Shine for the last 15 years. In addition, all of my other three horses are on Omega Horse Shine and show the same amazing results as Ivory Pal. For a happy, healthy, strong, and shiny horse, Omega Horse Shine can't be beat in results and price affordability. It is the best supplement your horse can be on. Awesome gal entered Cameron Ring's life when he was in college. She was a shy and a standoffish rescue horse recovering from the past abuse she had endured. And Cameron was at a crossroads in his life. But they would form a unique bond that grew stronger as the years went on. Cameron says he didn't rescue Awesome. 
awesome rescued him. She inspired him to recklessly follow his dreams without abandon. So Cameron quit his job and moved to New York, chasing the dream of acting, where he starred in both theater and film productions, including Prophet, the story of Nat Turner, the Thurgood Marshall story, and From Man to Superman. Soon Cameron realized the power of cinema in telling stories. And he wanted to use that power to tell awesome gals powerful story. Though we cannot change Awesome's past, we can change the future for thousands of other horses suffering from the same abuse by telling her story of hope, healing, and triumph. Well, welcome, Cameron Ring. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. You've never been on here with us, have you? <laughs> I have not. Um, that's why I'm really excited to be here. It's kind you of done- a big deal. It's, it- it's almost legendary. Oh, yeah, that's very nice. Of you. <laughs> you have done some great things in your short life and uh, some great work. And um, I've read your, your bio and a little introduction about you. But what we don't hear in that is just how in love you are with this horse named Awesome Gal. And I would love for you to tell us like the first moment you met her. Uh, um, first moment I met her. Let's see. We have to go. Back to way back. the yeah, way back about ten years, uh, maybe more. And I remember she was at a barn, the last barn um, that actually is not there anymore. Before mm-hmm. she, this is before she even came to us. She was still at the rescue barn, and I remember her in a weird way. She was she was notorious for being incredibly shy around people, especially males. But with me, I remember when I came up, I had heard about her and I said, hi, awesome. And her, she was back in the corner of her stall, but she looked curious. Her ears kind of perked up a little bit and she took one step towards me, like mm-hmm. one hoof went forward mm-hmm. and then stopped. <laughs> and that was as far as we got, but I kept Pretty on, um, but she, yeah, but it was, it was a big deal because normally she would cower, but she took, put one hoof forward and <laughs> stood there and just we just had this moment where we stared at each other for a while and then uh, I didn't want to push it so I left but I would come back every day and each day I got a little bit closer to her and now until now we're we're best friends oh yeah I know you'll people have yeah. to look at the show notes because that photo of you two I I keep saying that you guys are like oh. brothers of another mother well she's a girl but <laughs> <laughs> those yeah. beautiful my mom eyes. would say we're both her kids. That's what my exactly, mom would say. Exactly, exactly. And I love your mom <laughs> in this story too. So yeah, let's talk about your mom a little bit too, because she is as responsible for this rescue as you are, correct? Yes. Yeah, she is um she's the one who kind of put all of this in motion. It was so she's been around horses her whole life. Um and when she retired, she wanted to just go to um be around them with no pressure. And there was a rescue barn that she went to in Virginia and she just wanted to volunteer there. So she started volunteering and got along with all the horses. Great. Except for this one horse who was incredibly shy, would cower in the corner of the stall. um, Anytime a person came by. Um, But mom was really good with horses. And she noticed there was one person who, when this woman came by her, her name is Sissy, the whole, awesome would perk up and she'd be, have a whole totally different attitude mm-hmm. and she would come up and say hi. And even Sissy would do the, her chores and open the stall door and awesome would follow her around the barn. It was really cute. And it was, um, through this mom became friends with Sissy and she through that, her heard this incredible story of how they were both abused and they both escaped their abuse and came together and helped each other heal. And it was from there that mom was inspired to tell this story and flash forward to now we have awesome with us and we're telling her story. So yes, you are. It's been, it's pretty amazing. It's almost surreal. It is almost surreal, you know, because a lot of people would hear her story to hear you tell it and you're a good storyteller too, but to hear her, you tell it, people would say, Oh my gosh, it sounds like a movie. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah it, it, exactly. And that's kind of how it was. And um, we, when we finally, we got awesome with us, we, we finally took her out of the rescue barn to our place. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it was uh, it was kind of like that. It was almost in passing. It was like, hey, yeah, isn't that a weird story? It would make a great movie, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Kind of like that. And it started like that. And from there, it snowballed into, well, we should get some stories. We should get her stories and we should get this. And then we met and it kind of snowballed into this, this full length, pretty, I think it's a really good story. And it's pretty epic yes. of the, the healing of awesome and the, the woman. And so I think it's yeah. powerful and I'm happy Bridget. that I get a chance to tell I'm, it. I'm so glad yeah. that you, and you develop those characters really well. I got to read the script. It was re- it's really good. <laughs> um, but, and I'm not going to give anything yeah. away, but you can imagine, okay. you can imagine that when you've got those parallel lives going on, it's something that, you, you know, dad and I, Monty and I deal with somewhat um, on an unprofessional level, but we do run into a lot of people who've been healed by horses because of the relationship, really, frankly. But what yeah. I love about your story too, is that she awesome gal inspired you to follow your dreams. Now, not too many people tell us a story as extreme as that, but, but tell us a little bit about how she did that. Um, uh, she is a, I like to say she's a very deep spirit in a horse's body. Um, but it was through her that what you know, you're around horses a lot and you realize that really all they want is to be, fed and be happy and love. Mm-hmm. And from that, I was working at a job like nine to five or more, even longer hours, you know, suit, putting on a shirt and tie every day and going and struggling and working for somebody else. And I wasn't happy. And it was being around horses and realizing that maybe the simplest things are what really make you happy. And mm-hmm. it's okay to want to do what you want to do. And so because of that, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go for what I really want, which was I loved acting and I wanted to be in New York as a theater actor. And so I just quit my job one day and packed a backpack and went. (laughs) Did you put Awesome Gal in your back pocket? How did you part with her? Uh, I wish. Uh, (laughs) She is in Virginia. Mom, mom is who uh, my mom's name is actually Debbie, and she takes care of awesome it's her it's her horse she rescued her and it's her story so i would come back all the time at least once a month once a month and visit awesome mm. and i tell her how i was doing <laughs> she's a good listener uh, yeah i bet your mom your I, your mom and i not only share the name <laughs> but i think we share <laughs> probably a lot of things that we love about horses and about you too yeah. and i love you were just back in tryon which is interesting that there was a mm. film festival there and did you talk about yeah. awesome gal we actually last year premiered at Tryon. We were able ah. to show it in the opening night gala, which was great. It was the first time too. So I was confident with it, but it, it, it is a little nerve wracking to show it for the first time in front mm-hmm. of such a huge crowd, but uh, it got a great reception and I absolutely love that film festival. It's such but, a great experience. I would love to go. I'd love to see it. But now when you, you should, say, pre- I will, I will. Now I have somebody who <laughs> should show me where to go. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I will. I'll be there next. I'm going to go every year I can go because I have okay. such a great time every year. But you didn't premiere the movie because the movie isn't made yet. You the sh- premiered the trailer, correct. right? The yeah. trailer. So, yes, we, uh, yeah. So we're, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Let's make Part that clear. The the feature <laughs> length is not made. This is a short uh, proof of concept trailer that's meant to show what the film can be. And the trailer alone has won six awards. Wow. So we've been doing really well. And it, it's a testament to how powerful the movie is because it's really a six minute um, scene from, from the feature length script that we've done that we put in, made into a trailer. And um, I put a lot of work into it and had some, a great time too, but it's done really well. It is. Which I'm happy it, about. It is. It's super engaging. I mean, it's dramatic. It's super engaging. And there's a horse in it. So we all, you know, are going. And there's a horse in it. And I'm in it, too. <laughs> and you're in Oh, my gosh. That's right. That's, we should uh, say that. Yeah. You're acting yeah. in the movie, too. Um, yeah. And, yes. So what do people do? Well, it was a, how often do people do? How, how often do people get the opportunity to meet not only one of the actors in it, but to meet the makers of a movie before it's actually produced? Is that kind of rare that it's out there? Uh, by when well, all these yeah. yeah, well, we're the a film. 
like this, it is rare to have a short film do so well when you're with the intention of making a feature length. Usually people make a short film or they make a, a full length film, but we uh, were trying to do Austin's story justice. And so we wanted to have a way to showcase it because it's very difficult to say, I swear this, just trust me, read the script. And nobody wants to read scripts anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hard to get people to do that. But with a showcase that we did that done correctly, like the short film, it can be a great way to entice people to actually want to look at your story. Mm-hmm. Cause it's very hard to get noticed in Hollywood. <laughs> I <laughs> Which suppose. Is, well, just sheer well, the game. Yeah. And it's, yeah. and it's like, they all, I don't know. It just seems like they want nothing but sequels and superhero movies. Well, I don't mind those, but I think we need more horse movies. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, think I agree. So yeah, I think <laughs> that's, everybody what, that's what I'm trying agrees. to do. <laughs> Let's provide. Yeah, yeah I, have, I would hope so. <laughs> they have Secretariat out there, which did awesome, and we have uh, yeah. Seabiscuit Get out there, which has done awesome. And I feel yeah. like you know, every once in a while, a great horse movie comes around. That's a true story. Let's put that in there because yes. that's um, yeah. And and my producer always brings up no fake Winnie's, so we're going to have to talk to you about some uh, you know technical. <laughs> produ- oh produ- gosh, the fake Winnie. <laughs> ah! <laughs> No fake Winnie. Uh, awesome. no, wait, what is that? You no know, fake Winnie's, you know, like uh, like the oh. horse turns its head ever so slightly and no, they don't do that. They yes, don't. yeah, it's so obvious. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, <laughs> we will not I promise we won't do that. Technical production, uh, you know, by the layman here. Sorry, backseat drivers. But, um, yeah. but, what, <laughs> but, but we should introduce here that Awesome Gal is a Tennessee walking horse, which makes this yes. this story certainly for me, and I imagine for you too, that much more special because Tennessee walking horses are really fighting a war right now. And um, I don't need to get to be overly dramatic, but if people knew what the, you know, the big lick and some of the things that these uh, performance horses go through, I think they would be up in arms. I don't know. What do you think? Oh God. Yes. No, it's, it's, well, it's horrific, really. We, we depict it in the film, in, a, in our short film, we depict it and we kind of toned it down because it was almost too, the real thing is too graphic. Um, the Big Lick Gate, which I don't know how, a lot of people don't know about it, but it's a very fancy, um, elaborate gate that if you know horses and you look at it, you can tell it's not right. And any veterinarian will tell you it's a learned response to pain. So they, the way that they achieve this pain is, uh, by usually by, uh, painting acid on their, uh, or a corrosive chemical Mm -hmm. on their, uh, ankles and pasterns and then wrapping it. So it actually soaks in to, into the flesh causing Mm -hmm. pain. And they relieve that pain by lifting their hoof up and out in a exaggerated gait, which we know is a big lit gait, but really the horse is trying to relieve pain. Yeah, with chains which, around there that are touching that. insane to say out loud. And it then, yeah, they put the chains the and they put 15-pound stacks on it, too, so it makes it difficult. So, so it's in pain, but it has a tough time relieving that pain. And so when, yeah, so those chains and stacks cause it to really, in a weird, like, jerk way, force up the, its front hooves. Um, and if you look up on the Internet, you can see pictures of the Big Lick Gate. It, it's, it looks like they're in pain, and anyone who knows horses would know that. So, so awesome gal went through that. We're pretty sure about that, right? She was rescued yes. from that? We, uh, we understand that she was in a soaring barn. Um, she did escape the soaring barn. We think there may be, it might have been in Ohio. It's not there anymore. And we know that she was meant to be a broodmare, too. Mm-hmm. They wanted to train her to have this beautiful big lit gate and be a broodmare. Mm-hmm. And we know... From what we know, she was declared unmanageable because she didn't like being abused. And <laughs> some, and we, <laughs> and she did escape and found her way to Virginia. And mm. that's the, her journey. Right. But there's so a parallel an journey. Incredible journey. Yeah, a parallel journey going on with the, um, the, the woman in the film, too, that has her yes. own challenges. And we can give a little bit of that away, too. Yeah, of course. Um, it's she was a lot like Austin. She was in a very um, abusive household, and mm-hmm. 
she, they, she too, like awesome, escaped and ran away. And by chance, uh, faith, providence, they came together. And there were these two hurt individuals who found strength in each other. Mm-hmm. And it's powerful. It's even more powerful because it's true. Mm-hmm. And we based all of this on that woman's stories, Reggie's stories, just her recollections of her time with Austin before we came into the picture. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the story and I love that you're highlighting uh, something that is going on without being overtly political, but there are some political ram- ramifications that I hope we can help with too, is to stop this yeah, darn stuff. Yeah. It's a terrible, terrible way to treat yeah. horses. <laughs> it's and amazing think, in, the, in yeah. 2019, it still have things like that, like right. so barbaric still happen. Right. I, I can only think that people, as you say, don't really realize how rough it is on these horses yeah. because it, you know it's maybe it's a shrinking industry this Tennessee walking horse big lick because there are flat shots out there and other ways to yeah. um, to to enjoy these horses um, non performance wise too they're incredible yeah. across a field I mean anybody who's ever been on they a really are. they have a beautiful gate yeah. yeah you don't need to do any of that they have a beautiful natural gate they sure like, do. it's a such a beautiful walk they have in there such calm and temperamental animals. I mean, I love them. And it's really sad to hear what's happening. And I hope that, I mean, I can't change Awesome's past, but maybe by telling her story, I can change the future for mm-hmm. the hundreds of other horses that are experiencing this abuse. Exactly, Cameron. And that's what we love about what you're doing, too. I appreciate that. And I hope people will listen to this. And if you hear about the movie or you see the trailer, you can can they go on YouTube and find the trailer? They can. They can actually go to our website. Um, ah, better. Chan- yeah, it's chancesawesomegal.com because that's her full name. She's <laughs> Chances Awesome Gal. And you can see our awards, you can see the trailer, and you get, we actually give a history of, the, of soaring and the politics behind it because um, there is a political aspect. They are trying to outlaw it, but they've been trying. There have been groups that have been working on this for 30 years, and mm-hmm. it's so politically entrenched that um, it's hard to get over it. And I hope that's what a movie, this, this, this film would do, would, would bring, expose what's happening to, to the entire nation. So that they can see, and they, and then I think awesome story is an incredible way to tell what's happening. It is. I, I love that your idea is to, uh, you know, the definition of insanity, right? Keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different <laughs> exactly, results. Yes. Well, for 30 exactly. years, we've gone after this thing and it hasn't changed much. So I'm hoping your movie is the paradigm shift uh, to get the story out there. And you're the one to do Thank it, you. Cameron. You've got, you know, Thank you've got you. I appreciate it. Hollywood's ear a little bit. I mean, certainly you've had success in Hollywood and, and you're a good storyteller. So I hope people will take the opportunity. Do, what would you say to the person who says, um, Oh my gosh, you know, it is so hard to fight, uh, the, the politics and you know, the, everybody is so up in arms about all the other politics going on right now too. <laughs> it's kind of hopeless. What would you say to them? Don't be hopeless because. Be, well, don't be hopeless because that's how they continue on doing this. They assume that everyone will give up and go away. And so far it's worked, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to give up. And, um, I mean, if you don't want to do it for, if, if, if you're not motive, knowing that there are thousands of horses going through this right now, that are having chemicals put on their ankles so that they, to inflict pain, just to create a walk. And that's their entire life. They know nothing else. If that doesn't motivate you to do something, I don't. I don't know if I can help you. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know what you really say. <laughs> like, that's right. I get so, get out of the way. Get out of the way. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, tell somebody, you know. So go to your your website, and that's Chances Awesome Gal. Yes. Okay. And yes. Um, tell people about this trailer. Share it on social medias, and let's get an opportunity out there to find a funder for this movie. And, and get, yes, I think people would, are, yes. want more horse movies. So this is a good one. I would love that. Cause I think it will be the next, you know, there are, aren't that many horse films, but the ones that they do make are always, always seem to be pretty great yeah. and stunning work pieces of art. And I hope this is the next one. 
Well, if you're involved, it will be. So let's uh, let's get Cameron involved ah, in making you. this movie, and uh, you know, let's let's talk to some of those thought leaders like Priscilla Presley and some of those people that can yeah. make a difference in this in this fight. Yeah, for, Priscilla has been. Um, yeah. yeah, she's been. I know she's been working hard on this, and she has a. I mean, she's really been doing some good things, and I appreciate it. So we just need to to uh, keep the momentum going, like. Mm-hmm. We need more people to help us. Yes. So yes. it's such a, uh, it's not talked about as much as you would think it is considering how bad it is, how bad the, the abuse is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't understand that. So I enlist all of you listeners. <laughs> Me neither. I cannot. It's mind is mind blowing. Yeah. We're putting a badge on you and we're saying, go get them. And uh, we want people to, uh, to talk about it and, and get, you know, shine a light on it with some momentum now and not let it go back into the dark ages. Thank you, Cameron Ring, for being on Horsemanship yes. Radio and sharing your story, your real story and Awesome's real story and your mom, Debbie's story and, uh, and, your, yes. and your passion and I think the future. Thank you. Cavallo hoof boots are easy to get on and stay on in all types of terrain and activities. Unique drainage slots allows water to drain out quickly, and they are super easy to take off too. With Cavallo's, you spend your time on the trail with your best friend, not wasting time putting on complicated hoof boots. Cavallo hoof boots come in three durable upper options and two sole widths. You get confidence and security with their best boot ironclad warranty. Cavallo hoof boots take you where you want to go. Lauren Richardson is a licensed marriage and family therapist certified as an EGALA, mental health professional, and an equine specialist. After receiving her bachelor's degree in art history from the University of California, Santa Barbara, Lauren went on to earn her master's degree in clinical psychology from Antioch University. Today, Lauren has a private practice and also runs a family therapy program for mental health agency where she provides therapy to individuals, families, couples, and groups, and she's credentialed to supervise associates and training. Lauren's belief that animals are natural healers helped move her towards the goal of becoming an EGALA facilitator. Now, Erica Williams is an EGALA certified equine specialist as well as a horsemanship instructor. Her experience with horses as a young child sparked her desire to gain a deeper understanding of equine behavior. In 2003, Erica's pursuit of knowledge led her to begin studying horsemanship. She spent the following years assisting accomplished horse trainers, participating in horsemanship clinics, and completing intensive courses. Erica started teaching people and their horses in 2012 and became certified through EGALA in 2016. Currently, she also co-teaches natural horsemanship at Midland, a college preparatory school in Los Los Olivos, California. Whether teaching horsemanship or facilitating equine-assisted growth and learning, Erica is passionate about helping individuals discover their true potential through their relationship with the horse. Well, welcome. Embrace Solutions. I've got two lovely ladies here from the San Inez Valley. I'm very excited to talk to you both. We've introduced you and uh, we're all duly impressed by all the initials after your names, but I'm impressed with your horsework. So that's what we want to talk about today and how you transfer that uh, to help us humans out who need more help than the horses. But I'd like to start with you, Erica. How did you get involved in horses and how far back? Oh, thank you. So excited to be here. Um, let's see. When I got started with horses, I believe I was about three years old. Oh, my gosh. Uh, my, <laughs> yeah, my mom actually uh, borrowed my aunt's pony, like, oh. periodically, and would take me on pony rides throughout the neighborhood. And I, of course, just loved it. Uh, just couldn't get enough. Um, so from there... Uh, four years old, started taking riding lessons. I believe I was the youngest student um, that they were on the fence about taking, but uh, I apparently made the cut because they kept me in the program. Okay. And <laughs> yeah, so after that, it was pretty much all history. Um, so I was about 11 years old when I got my first horse. And I'm very excited to say that I still have that horse. Um, She's about 25 now. Um, I got her when she was two. And so that journey, of course, has been lifelong. And that was what really 
took me into the natural horsemanship world. Um, she being a younger horse, uh, being a novice rider, a young person, um, we definitely yeah. had some growing, growing up to do. And she had some oppositional reflex and um, just traditional methods. Um, she's somewhat of a dominant horse. And so traditional methods were kind of escalating issues. So yeah. we got into natural horsemanship and uh, just was fascinated by the results and the conversation that was able to go on um, with my horse. And so from there, uh, throughout, I kind of, you know, been into my teenage years and my early adulthood kind of wasn't doing a whole lot with the horses. Uh, and then I was doing a lot of nannying randomly. Mm -hmm. And somehow, you know, I still had my horse and somehow that kind of got me back into the horses in a different way. I was kind of drawing some parallels between what I was doing with the kids and, and mm -hmm. my, my horsemanship skills. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the first little um, uh, gap that was being bridged. And I started studying more intently um, and just getting all the information that I could. Do you consider there as aspects of children like a flight animal, like you do in the horses? Oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, you know, just the whole aspect of um, responding versus reacting is definitely part of that program with the, with the kids and also with the horses, you know, when they're reacting to something, you know, they're just drawing off their innate innate instincts, um, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And uh, the kids too, you know, mostly they're, <laughs> depending on the child, um, we're usually dealing with more fight, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, sometimes yeah. flight and freeze as well. You know, there's, there's some things in there as well, for sure. Yeah. That's where we should bring Lauren in, I think, and, and have her, yeah. Uh, yeah. And have her tell us, I mean, the horses are fine, Lauren, I think. Um, how is it they're helping us? Um, well, that is kind of the most exciting part of, of what we do the, that we both are the most passionate about is really the power of the horses um, and how, you know, they as prey animals, um, they are complete, you know, they have so much self-awareness mm -hmm. and they you know, their survival depends on them being very tuned in with their environment. Um, that's just at the top priority. And so they, um, you know, they really feel and experience what comes into their space. And that includes us. Mm -hmm. And so as when the clients, they come into a session with the horses, the horses are picking up immediately on what that client is bringing in. And so they immediately start giving feedback and that feedback can often parallel situations in our lives. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whatever it is we bring into our relationships and how we navigate, how we communicate, um, whether or not we are congruent, you know, what we're feeling is what we're showing and how that kind of plays out. And the horses really help give honest, immediate feedback that, um, that, as an experiential therapeutic mm -hmm. model that we work through, they get to make those changes and adjustments in real time with the horses. Whereas in talk therapy, you know, mm -hmm. we talk about stuff and then we kind of encourage clients to then practice it out in their lives. But with the horses, they get to do it right there and then in a very safe, non-judgmental way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And are the kids yeah. usually familiar with horses when they come to you or is this kind of a new, intimidating, fascinating thing for them? Um, both. Um, sometimes, you know, being in the same as Valley, there's a lot of um, access to horses for a lot of people. And so some kids are, you know, kind of they know horses, they may have ridden one or pet one and some have none. And so we get, and same with all the, the adults we work with, it's kind of the same, the same experience. So we get quite a range and we have, um, also have miniature donkeys in oh. our program that help a lot with those who are, who are very intimidated by horses and may need a little bit um, of a transition before they can get 
to our bigger animals. Simply scale then at that point. Is that right? Right, the, right. The donkeys exactly. are small. Yeah. Sometimes they have more yeah. attitude than our horses though, right? <laughs> right. As Eric is really good at explaining the donkeys, they give a very different feedback because they <laughs> use lack of movement sometimes to communicate, whereas horses will use more movement depending on what's going on. And so the donkeys give us a lot of neat opportunities as well for people that may be looking at communication and and patience and all these different things kind of working with someone in a different way. I love that. Lack of movement are the donkeys. That's yeah. kind of, that's a, right. Easy. Right. It's that like that, you know, their <laughs> reputation for being stubborn is um, we like to say um, thoughtful mm-hmm. and Good. Uh, they think about things and they instead do. of, you know, they kind of stop instead of move. Yes, exactly. Time. Less reaction. Yeah. And, and you're yeah. both EGALA trained, which is fascinating. Maybe, Erica, you can jump in there with behaviors of the horses versus donkeys and, and horses in general, because I, I imagine that some of the horses do get into some behavioral uh, trenches that you don't want to have around your practice. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you work with them on that. Oh, yeah. Good question. Um in the, in the Agala model, you know, we try not to put too much interpretation on what the horse is doing. So as long as it's in a safety realm, we allow it to go on. Um, it allows for a lot of learning by the client. Um, you know, if the horse is, say, running around um, profusely, uh, we may let that play out a little bit uh, just so the client can really get a feel for what the horse is reacting to. Um, And as far as maybe some aggressive behaviors and things like that, um, it depends on the population that we're serving. Uh, We do have some horses that are definitely more extroverted in their approach. And so they're going to be um, they're going to be in our space a lot more than some of the other uh, horses that we work with. And within that, we really just try to make sure that the client that we're, we have in the session or clients that we have in the session are aware enough to uh, address what is going on. Mm-hmm. So unless there is something really um, obnoxious going on, we don't, we don't step in. Um, we really tell the clients to, to embody what the horses do. And because they're prey animals, they are amazing at taking care of themselves. Um, mm-hmm. That's how they survive. And so we tell the clients that there's not a lot of hard and fast rules besides take care of yourself. And if we see something that is not being seen, we will step in and call them over and chat about that. But a lot of times everything goes really well in the sessions uh, because we're allowing that space, because we are not putting a lot of expectations on the horse or the client. Mm -hmm. Everyone is allowed to be themselves. So typically we don't have a lot of things where we need to step in and, uh, and stop the session, which is great. Yeah, that's great. So the families stay uninvolved in that too? Or do you have people outside the pens that are watching? or typically, is that... typically not for confidentiality reasons, unless yeah. we have um, unless we have a minor in a session. Um, sometimes the family would maybe stay around for the first session or so. Mm, um, but we okay. find that sometimes that can be a big distraction. Uh, so we, we would prefer to invite the families in. Or if they're not interested in being part of the session, sometimes they leave and come back. Mm-hmm. Um, but typically we try, whoever's on the property, <laughs> we try to make sure they're in the session or they're, they're kind of not, um, they're not observing. Yeah, good. That makes sense to me too. And on any kind of instruction, doesn't it, where we we're, might start leaning yeah. on somebody for that. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking that yeah. would interfere with the horse's reaction too. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you, also just okay. what, Oh, sorry. Um, Just a little side note about that. Also, um, Lauren and I, as facilitators, you know, we have to be aware of what we're bringing into the session as well. Uh And as far as the EGALA model goes, that's part of our training is to make sure that we are very aware of anything that we may be bringing into the the session, expectations, um, what we think is right or wrong, all of those things we really try and check into so that the session can be a blank slate 
for the horses and for the client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. It, it, that must be difficult. How do you keep your physiology <laughs> separate from what's going on in the tent? <laughs> we, I, mean, I really would just want to echo what Erica said. Like us in, in introducing our interpretations, we really risk pulling the client away from a possible connection or link to their solution, which this model is client-centered solution focus. So it's that the client is the expert, not us. And so we have to be really careful, especially myself. I also have a private practice, so I do a lot of talk therapy. So, you know, I had to do a lot of work around stepping back and not interpreting. Um, and Eric and I, you know, we try and debrief after sessions and, and, and ask each other questions and point stuff out about, you know, what we may have been bringing into the session that didn't need to be there. And a big piece of that is the clean language piece, which Agala is all about clean language is, you know, we, we name things as what they are, not mm-hmm. with interpretive language. So the brown yeah. horse or, you know, things like that or moving forward, moving backward, not moving away or, or going, going out, you know, there's a lot of um, little messages in there that we could be, kind of um, putting into their story and moving it somewhere else. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of power with this external kind of distance perspective, perspective that clients can really safely explore um, through talking about the horses and with us, us also talking about the horses and not them. And then that also keeps our stuff out of it. Um, right. It's a very emotional, emotionally safe model in that way. And honestly, um, you know, the client can just work through these things in their life without ever having to share specifically what that is. And that can be very safe for them. So there's a lot of use of metaphors and symbols and the client chooses if and when to come out of that metaphor. We don't, we don't guide them out. We just meet them right where they're at and we use their language. Got it. it Erica, growing up with horses since age three, did you have to really work on cleansing some of this horse talk out of your lexicons? <laughs> it would be hard for me. Yeah, you, you know, it was interesting. Uh, I think what was for me is um, being in, in more of the natural horsemanship realm where the horses are also allowed to have a conversation uh, it was actually relatively uh, a seamless transition. And and because the Igawa model is not teaching horsemanship, um, mm-hmm. it was really easy to just leave all that stuff, <laughs> leave yeah. all that stuff uh, somewhere else and not bring that in. Uh, but I really do uh, attribute, you know, just just kind of having some some background and allowing conversations to happen the way that they need to happen uh, that really kind of helps that that transition. Nice. Nice. You know, this brings up, you use natural horsemanship a lot and you both are coming, oh, you, you both have Igala training, but you're coming from different aspects of this partnership. I would love for both of you to define for us, each of you, to define for us what you say natural horsemanship is. Sure. Um, so for me, so for me, I, I translate natural horsemanship into good horsemanship, Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that we are respecting the horse and what they have to bring in and that we are allowing them to thrive, that they're not just getting by, that they're finding some intrinsic motivation, uh, that they, uh, that they are enjoying what they're doing, Mm -hmm. um, and, and enjoying that connection. I think is a big part. I think that there are a lot of people that do quote traditional horsemanship that are actually embodying a lot of natural ways of communication. Um, I don't specifically think it's a lot about the tools. I really believe that it's about the application mm-hmm. of whatever theory you're working off of, you know, how are you working off of it and how much of your own stuff are you bringing in? Because really that's what you know, can cause some relationship stuff with the horse, even just in our own horsemanship is Mm -hmm. just our own stuff that we're bringing in our own beliefs, our own thoughts and, um, and our own kind of triggers. So just being aware of all those things, I believe you can, you can practice natural horsemanship without practicing anything, um, following any one specific person or modality or anything. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah. And Lauren, this is this wasn't something you were raised with horses, is that right? Or were you? I didn't ask. No, I was. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I, I I've um had horses my entire life. So ah, family, okay. other great horse people. Um, I grew up with them. You know, they did a lot of things from polo cross to trail riding, cutting, team pinning and all that competitive oh, wow. stuff. So I was in, you know, I participated, um, but I never had a ton of passion around it. I was always gravitated more towards horses as companions. And mm-hmm. there was a lot of stuff that around more traditional training and relationships, um, no judgment, but that didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just kind of like what Eric is saying, the respect piece is really huge that, um, that just treating them in a certain way that gave them a voice and um, honoring that and learning from them, Mm -hmm. not just them learning from us or doing what, you know, we ask them to do, but having a partnership and a relationship that is um, respectful and communicative. I've had my horse since he was born and he's 28. Oh my goodness. That's awesome. He's like, he's taught me, he's very, um, as Erica would describe, she's taught me a lot about horse psychology, but um, he's very introverted and um, smart. He thinks a lot, but he's very, um, I mean, I guess I'll say sensitive and, um, mm-hmm. you know, to energy and all whatever's coming into his space. And so he's really taught me a lot about myself and about um, a different way of being with horses. Mm-hmm. And so... I'm really that I think that's kind of how I would describe my under, you know, my experience with natural horsemanship. Mm. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Lucky horses that you guys are around. Do people ever bring their own horses to your practice to work with? Well, that's a good question. We have not had that. Hmm. No, we've we, talked we about it. Although, <laughs> yeah, we can, we, yeah. yeah, we, we can travel. So we don't necessarily have to conduct sessions only on our site. We can go to other sites and use other horses. And so um, that's always an option for people if they have horses and they really would like to use their own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting just to have you yeah. both as facilitators in between somebody working with their horse, if, if you felt it was an appropriate horse, of course, you know, but since your horses are such great relationships with you guys going way back, it would be kind of fun if somebody had sort of that same opportunity, but, um, but wonderful. I just, I love what you're doing. I'm so glad that um, my friend, uh, our veteran, Dan Kinahone, uh, turned us on to you guys. Embrace Solutions is the name of your uh, practice, correct? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. That's so, I, I can't believe the San Ynez Valley since I, I don't know, since I was very young, we've lived there and I can't, and it goes back and it's just evolved so beautifully in the San Ynez Valley to be so diverse, have so many different kinds of disciplines and, and uh, breeds. It's just been amazing. And you guys just add to it. So I'm really glad you're there. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place in the The magic in the language of the Well, it's producer Jen this time around while Jamie takes a break from the Ask Monty segment. And the question is, have horse training methods improved? About your methods of training horses, you question some traditional methods, for example, the use of the whip, but it's still the main item in many horse shops. You've been part of the horse market for a long time. How is it changing? Monty's answer. It's changing, but certainly not enough to suit me. I am 84 and I would like to see it speed up a lot. The production of pain administered by a human being to a flight animal is one of the least intelligent actions the human race has ever utilized. Horses seek a safe place. When we cause them pain, the flight animal sees it as an unsafe place. The word break comes clearly into this picture because if you produce enough pain, you can cause a flight animal to give up, to be broken, to follow instructions not because they want to, but because they are afraid not to. This, to me, is a pathetic action caused by people who simply haven't thought this process through. 
For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Yeah. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, at the Horse Sense and Healing Clinic, December 13, 14, and 15, 2019, at Flag is Up Farms. Then we have the CHA Equine Facilities Management Certification Course at Flag is Up Farms, January 24, 25, and 26 of 2020. And I'm excited about that. We've got the CEO of CHA, Certified Horsemanship Association. That's Christy Landware. And then put advanced planning in your calendar for June 21, 22, and 23 of the year 2020 because Monty Roberts and Temple Grandin are to get to, getting together with some outstanding speakers and trainings, and we're going to have our third annual The Movement. We're really excited about that. So put that on your calendar. Turn the page, 2020, June, mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. The, the Movement, because because you have a large numbers of, number of speakers at that each year, because that'll be your third one, yeah? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And we're going to three days because we're going to put more horse work in there too. Just people want to see more of it illustrated with the horses. And uh, so we're keeping about the same number of speakers, but we're increasing the number of horses worked with. So it's really fun. And for the CHA Equine Facilities Management course, Mm -hmm. uh, where can they find information about taking the course? Yeah, it's on the Certified Horsemanship Association website and also on the MontyRoberts.com website. And it is um, less of a course and pretty much strictly a certification. Right. This is a certification process, whereas you've already done all of your studying. Exactly. You come prepared for that and you get certified at different levels depending on your expertise. But the cool thing is they also learn from each other. So you can almost say there's a bit of a course involved too, because when you're being tested on how you handle certain situations, everybody learns something because everybody, you know, has worked around horses for a long time in, in general. And so, you know, you'll learn, oh, I never thought about doing it that way. So I was fascinated following them around for three days, listening to these learned people get certified. It's really fantastic. This is the second one of those you've done at Flag is Up Mm -hmm. Farm, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We hope to do them annually because they're really, they're a cool way to um, do something fun in January. And, uh, you know, it's a great facility for that. We just have everything there at Flag. There we go. And if you're looking for a reason to go to beautiful California in the winter, Mm -hmm. um, you can always go and visit Flag is Up Farm. They are open to visitors and you can do that by going to MontyRoberts.com and surfing around on there. It's a great website. It's a fresh new look, and it's so easy to navigate. Thank Thank you. you. (laughs) It is easier now. Thanks. It's easy to find stuff. It's it's got actual text and real words. (laughs) So you read the words, and then you click on the words, and what you want to find is there. It's there. (laughs) Amazing. And if you're the conversational sort and you want to talk to somebody about visiting Flags Up Farms or attending one of the clinics or becoming a certified trainer, you can do that too. And their phone number is 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, you can go to horsemanshipradio.com and you're going to find links, photos, and more information about today's topics and guests. And we love your feedback. It helps Debbie find new people to talk to and new topics to discuss. Yeah. That's right. And do that on Facebook. Go to Facebook, type in Monty Roberts, like and follow the one that has a little blue check mark. Although I hear through the grapevine that they're getting rid of the blue check marks. But look no. For okay. <laughs> look for Monty Roberts. Rate and follow, put comments there, talk to Debbie, or you can call them on the phone at 805-688-6288 and say, hey, on Horsemanship Radio, talk about this. They'll write it down and give it to Debbie. It's great. That's right. And you can follow Monty on Twitter, Mm -hmm. Monty underscore Roberts, and the same on Instagram, Monty. 
underscore Roberts. That's right. We're everywhere. That's right. You are. And everywhere. so is Horse Radio Network. So is How Horse do we Radio get to Network. them? That's right. We mm-hmm. are on Android and iTunes and iPhone. We're everywhere. We have our very own app. Just go to your app store and download it. Horse Radio Network. It's free. It's easy to use. You can listen to us on your favorite podcatcher, like Spotify, for example. We're there, too. Yeah. Yeah. See, you're everywhere. But many thanks to our sponsors. That's Omega Fields, Cavallo Horse and Rider, and Monty Roberts University. Without them, we're pretty quiet around here. So be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours.